It's time for the VolQuest podcast, where we dissect the biggest news items of the week. Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast presented by our good friends at Smoky Mountain Organics. Be sure to check them out online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com or visit them at one of their four locations, Gatlinburg, Pigeon Ford, Sevierville, or their newest location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike. That's right across from Trader Joe's. Uh, be sure to check them out for all the latest um, natural healing processes that then products that are available out there. They've got them for you at Smoky Mountain Organics. Again, you can also visit them online at SmokyMountainOrganics.com. With Austin Price and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Glad to have you with, along with us on this Tuesday. Before we get started, I do want to say publicly our thoughts and prayers and condolences to uh, the family of Paris Harrelson, um, who uh, passed away at way too young of an age. And um, Paris was one of the good guys. I mean, he, he, was a, he was a delight to cover all the way back in the recruiting process. Never seemed to have a bad day. Loved to play the game of football. And um, he did his family well at the University of Tennessee and with the San Francisco 49ers. That was a, a very loving and prideful family. His mom was a sweet lady and um, gone way too soon. So again, our, our thoughts and prayers are, are with Paris. It, one, of the, one of the best ones I've ever covered. Just a great guy to deal with. Yes. And how, there's been a lot of like nice guys who came through the program that would flip a switch on Saturday, but I don't know if anybody had a different, a, a larger difference in their off-field demeanor versus their on-field demeanor. I mean, yep. it was a million miles away. Yep. When he crossed the white lines, AP, he was playing, but off the white lines, uh, outside the white lines, it, it was different. So again, our, our thoughts and prayers are, are with him and his family as, as, uh, just gone way too soon. I don't. I don't know what else to say uh, other than great guy to cover, and uh, we'll we'll sorely be missed. And um, was it was a really really classy Tennessee ball. Well, I mean, you know, this is you know Ladarrell McNeil a few months ago, now Paris Harrelson, and I mean, he particularly hits home with me because he was one of my classmates when I was in school at UT. And uh, you know, I mean, you talk about some good guys, Tony Brown, uh, Paris Harrelson. Um, you know, there there were you know a few that you know, were really nice to me as players and as a fellow classmate. And uh, you're exactly right. Um, you know, and, and a guy that, you know, had a nice little run with the 49ers, you know, in, in the NFL. And, you know, it just, uh, it sucks, man. I mean, like, you know, you guys are older than I am, but, you know, you start, you know, losing kids that are either my age or a little bit less and, you know, just hits home more and more. Certainly does. And um, he did Mississippi proud. He did his family proud. It was a huge win in recruiting for Tennessee. And it didn't take long after visiting him to understand why Tennessee liked him so much, both as a player and as a person. He was a great fit in Tennessee's program uh, with a lot of other good guys and teammates in that run that he was a part of. Let's get on to uh, happier thoughts and, and better things ahead for Tennessee. They take on a Tennessee Tech team this weekend that is not very good. Um, can't do a whole lot, uh, struggled uh, in a shutout loss to Furman last week. Um, Austin, when you see a game like this on the schedule, you know it's supposed to be a win. What, what, what do you think is important uh, for Tennessee this week and, and this weekend? Obviously, we'll talk more about this game as the week goes along, but, but this is not about Tennessee Tech. What, what is it, what's the importance for Tennessee this weekend? To make plays, build some confidence, um, throw touch passes. I mean, like, you know, I, you know, I mean, you know, I, I think to, to quote the great Jim Ross, Tennessee needs a game where they stomp a mud hole in them and they walk it dry. And, you know, uh, you know, and that, and that honestly is what I think, you know, needs to happen. I mean, you know, I think Tennessee needs to throw it early. Then you throw it often with no matter who the quarterback is. And, um, you know, I just think Tennessee needs one of those good cleanse games where they just beat the tar out of somebody. And, uh, you know, Maybe Tennessee Tech's that team. You know, Rob, running for 300 yards in this game doesn't, doesn't seem like it, it accomplishes a whole lot for Tennessee. I mean, it, this is – you got to figure out how to throw the football moving forward and, and, and protect better up front as well. I, I don't think there's any question. I mean, whatever you're going to do at quarterback, you need to use this game to try and iron some things out. Um, yeah, I'm with, I mean, you know, they ran for 300 yards against Bowling Green. I didn't think the run game was – I didn't think that was reflective of what we saw against Pittsburgh. I thought they struggled. And, you know, I think clearly not having Cooper out there is a factor. Not, you know, as the old saying goes, it makes you worse at two positions. 
when you have to move Carvin over and, and bring somebody off the bench for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, you got to figure out how to consistently get it done in the air. And, you know, this minor, get a takeaway. I mean, being five, minus five in, in the takeaway department in, in the first two games, you haven't generated one yet. That That's a little alarming to me. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think to get there, you got to get a, pa- a more consistent pass rush without having to blitz everybody. Maybe Byron Young can, can bring that into play. Were, were you guys surprised at, at, at the way Josh Heupel spoke about the quarterback position on Monday, or was that kind of what you thought that – I think we probably all thought he would be noncommittal on who the starter was, but um, were you surprised he talked about Milton as much as he did at the quarterback position, or is that the way it was kind of set up to answer from a question standpoint? I, I felt like it was set up to answer that way, um, you know, and so – uh, I, I'm not surprised he was non-committal. I mean, I think there's going to be a, multiple quarterbacks playing this game. There should be. I mean, again, Tennessee, you know, should, uh, you know, lay waste to Tennessee Tech. Furman just shut them out. So, I mean, you know, I, I just I, – I think they're going to play multiple guys. I don't – you know, it, to me it was clear that he's not moving on from Joe Milton. Now, maybe he starts Hendon Hooker Saturday and lets Joe see it from a different perspective, much like uh, Jarrett saw it from a different perspective coming off the bench, at, you know, a time or two, but uh, it, to me, it's clear Joe Milton's going to still play as long as he can play. And like I said, I watched him walk out of the complex. He looked fine. Now, that doesn't mean he can accelerate, push off, that type of thing, but just walking, he looked normal. Rob, is this the case if Joe Milton goes that you go into this game and you say, okay, third series, we're playing quarterback X, you know, who, who we didn't start, you know, um, and, and now we're getting into that deal where – these guys are basically going to kind of duke it out on the field type thing? Or, or do you think Josh Heupel goes back and, and rolls with one guy until the game is out of reach and, and then goes with another guy? I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I think Hooker deserves to start. But I think he, what he did in a little over two quarters is more efficient, more productive than anything we've seen from Milton in, in basically six quarters almost. Now, he wasn't great by any means. I mean, he had two turnovers of his own. You know, he didn't – Hit any huge plays in the passing game, but I mean, at quarter, if you're if you're not accurate, it doesn't matter what else you bring to the table. And, and Milton just has not been accurate. I mean, I don't know any other way to say it. I'm with you. I don't, I don't, you know, put him in mothballs. I keep working with him, and and yeah, and in, in this kind of game, I would make sure he got to play and continue to evaluate and continue to try to develop, develop him on the practice field, in the film room, but. I think Hooker deserves a start. I think Tennessee wins that game if Hooker plays four quarters on Saturday. I mean, he, he led three touchdown drives. You know, he yes, he had the two turnovers, but he was – I mean, he made plays. That that 23-yard run he had to convert third and 15 in the third quarter, that that was probably the biggest play of the game for me as, as far as Tennessee's offense went. Does, does Tennessee win that game if Joe Milton plays the entire game? I think – I mean, I, I, I was – I didn't even know Milton was hurt. I thought Heifel had benched him. I mean, and, and I think it would have made sense at that point, you know, in, at that stage of the game. What, four overthrows would have been huge plays and a fumble? I mean, I, I, I didn't realize at the time that he was hurt until a few minutes, you know, after Hooker, after Hooker had taken a few snaps. Here was the interesting thing, and, and also I think you bring up a good, a good point, question. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, but based on what we saw, I mean – I, I don't know the way Joe Milton was playing. Would, would he have completed that touchdown pass to to Jacob Warren? Would he have thrown it out there in a position where Jimmy Callaway could have scored on it the way he did? I, I don't I don't know the answer to those things. I think Hooker's feet were certainly a bigger factor than Milton's. I know Milton had the one long run, but Rob makes a, a good point there on the third and 15 scramble play. The one thing that, that Josh Heupel said that caught my attention was the fact that they, they, they did not play with the tempo that they wanted to in that game on Saturday, which to me, translation is once Hooker went into the game, we weren't as efficient. We weren't up to game speed. We weren't playing tempo-wise the way that they needed to. Now, I don't think that cost them the game, but I thought it was interesting that he made that point. So the question is, is that a big deal in your quarterback decision or can you get Hooker up to speed? I mean, obviously he's – we think he's taking first team reps if Joe Milton's not practicing or not a hundred percent at this point. So how much more efficient can he be from end of end of play to next snap, Austin? 
Are, are you surprised? I, I mean, I don't know to answer your question. I mean, you would think that he's going to be better going from last game to this game, but I mean, I, I'm surprised because he was here all in the spring. So he knew the tempo they wanted to go. He did he not go that tempo in the spring. I mean, they, they got, you know, you know, they split the reps early in fall camp. Now they started giving them more to Joe near the end, the last couple of weeks, but you know, early in fall camp, they split them pretty good. Um, to me, it's just, it just seems odd that they weren't able to go I mean, as fast, you know, or, or, you know, close to being the same speed as what they did with Joe. Yeah, I mean, surprise, but I didn't feel like, I mean, they still, uh, Rob, I think caught Pitt in a couple of situations where they had too many men on the field. I mean, it wasn't like they were playing methodical all of a sudden. I, I just, I was, I was a little bit surprised by, by that, by that comment from, from, from Coach Heupel. Yeah. Like that was a kind of a bigger deal because I didn't feel like, yes, their tempo was slower but I didn't feel like they were plotting along in the second half with Hendon Hooker. You know, I didn't really either until, I mean, and I don't think they're plotting, but I, I think instead, you know, in that first game, I was, I was paying attention and I did not pay as much attention to this last one, but against Bowling Green, they were generally back up and ready to snap the ball with about 32 seconds left on the 42nd clock. And I don't think they, I don't think they were there. I think it was, I think it was more like 24, 25, which is still plenty fast for, for most teams but not the way Hopper wants to go. And for instance, they, they just ran 66 total plays in a game where they got 20 first downs, which I bet is probably 20 fewer snaps than the head coach wants. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't looked at that stat. Um, so I, can they get up to speed? How big of a factor is that in the quarterback race? Um, it, it's certainly going to be a, a storyline to watch. All right, Austin, when you talk about the um, offensive line and, and – the fact that they've had as many penalties as they've had, the holding penalties. We, we talked about this a little bit on the two-minute drill. Is this going to be a different look for Tennessee on this offensive line this week? Do you play Cooper if he's healthy? Do, do you play Crawford? What, what do you do on the offensive line? I mean, they don't have the depth there that, that Glenn Ellerby was touting in the start of spring uh, fall camp, which none of us thought at the time where he said that, that, that they had that kind of depth. Um, how, how do they create depth? Is this a game about creating depth? What, what are you doing on the offensive line this week? I mean, the head coach contradicted Ellerby today. He's like, you know, I think you guys know we weren't real deep. <laughs> I was like, what? I mean, like, Ellerby went on and on about having 10 guys. Um, you know, yeah, I think you're going to see different combinations. Um, you know, I think you're going to see potentially Cade shifted inside. I think you'll see some Jeremiah Crawford out of tackle as they try to put him – um, kind of in the spin cycle and let him, you know, get uh, as much run as he can get because if they're going to be counting on him when we get to these SEC games, then he needs to play and play and play. And when you're really down to just this one game before you dip into SEC play with at the swamp in a night game, you know, Missouri, and then back home for South Carolina and Ole Miss. So, um, you know, I think you'll see some different combinations. I think you can always go back to Cade at tackle if, if Crawford were to – you know, struggle to handle things mentally. But uh, I'm not sure about Cooper. You know, Coach Heifel was kind of asked that today in a roundabout way. Like, how do you manage, like, you know, playing a guy who's maybe 80% versus just letting him get to 100 by not playing him? Um, and he kind of gave this, like, a long-winded answer that really didn't answer anything. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't play Cooper. I, You know, then they <laughs> Parker Ball out there and, and beat Tennessee Tech, you know, with their eyes closed. So, I mean, you know, I, I would just, you know – Try to work in guys like Crawford, um, like William Parker, um, you know, like R.J. Perry, just to see what you have. You know, just, just you know, let's throw them out there and see what happens. These guys should be able to block the Golden Eagles. Rob, so with, with that injury thought there, I mean, do you set Hyatt? I mean, I, I think Jalen Hyatt needs some confidence if he's cleared to go. Do you, do you play those guys or do you set everybody who's remotely not who's not a hundred percent or who's battling something. How many of those guys you set this week to get ready for Florida a week from now? Oh, I would play Hyatt if he's, if he's ready to go. Cause that, that, that's a concussion, right? Am I, that's what, yeah, that's what. It I mean, if, it, if it's not a, you know, if it's not a sprained ankle that, you know, would, would definitely benefit from two or three more days of staying off it. I would, or, you know, Jabari small probably doesn't need to get hit on that shoulder this week and, 
I would I would sit I would I would play high and I would sit in anybody else that is remotely you know dealing with anything. All right, let's flip it over to the defensive side of the ball. What, what do you think Byron Young is going to do this this week? Well, I think he's going to. I think he's going to have a sack or two. I mean, I, I think it'd be about near impossible for him to not have a sack or two. I don't think Tennessee Tech's, you know, very good up front, and you know he's chomping at the bit. Tyler Barron said out there before while Jerome Carver were talking today, and he and I were talking about you know, just, you know, about Byron. And I said, man, how it pumped is that kid? He goes, he's, he's busting at the seams. He's so excited. And, and he goes, he goes, honestly, he goes, I'm more excited to see him play than I am to play myself. Like, I think that, you know, Tyler is a, you know, kind of a guy that's kind of helped Byron, even though Byron's older, learn how to practice at this level, learn how to do certain things at this level. But I think Tyler is also very cognizant that, you know, Byron's got a lot of talent and, can help him. So I think he's excited to kind of see number six get out there and, and do his thing. Rob, I know you've been high on Byron Young along with a lot of other people because of the, I mean, the guy looks like a dude for sure. I mean, how much does he change this defensive front that I think through two games has overachieved, particularly against stopping the run, but how much more complete can he make this defensive front? I mean, I think that's the weakness that you see in him right now is not being able to get to the quarterback. I mean, I think, it's one of the reasons Tennessee had such a really tough time in the back end on Saturday is that, you know, Pickett was able to buy, you know, even if it, even if it wasn't there immediately, he was able to buy time with his feet and, you know, make some, some big plays. So I think getting another, the only guy that I see, you know, threatening to get home is, is Tyler. You know, maybe, you know, I'm, you know, against Bowling Green, it was a different story, but I, I, the only guy I thought got really consistent push against Pitt was, was Barrett. And I, I, as Austin just said, I think it's going to not only be great to, to get an explosive guy like Young out there, but it's going to help Tyler as well. And, man, let me just – Tyler Barry is ex- – I, I thought he would make an impact this year, but, man, he's really exceeded my expectations through two games. I mean, I think he's the most dynamic guy up there in the front seven, and I don't think it's close. I mean, there's – Matthew Butler's steady and playing really good football, but as far as, you know, forcing the issue and – and flashing and showing up in the backfield. I, I've been really impressed with Barry. Yeah, he's got to stay healthy uh, so he can get get more snaps. You know, obviously he dealt with two or three different things on on Saturday, it, it looked like. Uh, one of those, I'm not sure how much he was dealing with something there. He kind of um, look, looked like, looked like and, he took a little flop there at one point. with it. But, they, but you know, he, he went out and was out for several plays. So, I, that, I mean, it's not like he came right back in. That, that played – yeah, that, that play that he made down, like, after after Tennessee, he had gone forward on fourth inside the five and not made it. Tyler made a play from big time where he, you know, clubbed the ball carrier while while he was being blocked and two-yard loss and led to that – led to a third and 11 and then a punt. So, the other I mean, thing- he, was a, he was a highly ranked recruit. I was just – he's got – I think he's got a real chance to outperform his ranking, being a top 250 kid. Austin, one other thing that jumps out to me about this team, um, and and this goes back to the special teams deal, is I just see some of these guys, some of these young guys making plays. You know, we, you know, obviously Christian Charles blocked a punt, but you see Rucker make a play. On special seeing, teams. You're seeing Mohan make a play. Some different guys make plays. I mean, I, I'm pretty impressed, and, and I think fans should be encouraged with some of these young guys and what they're doing right now. Yeah, I mean, it just – does it not feel like to me – and I'm not saying he, that he's going to start, you know, next week. But does it not feel like to me But my November, Christian Charles is really going to be pushing either Jalen McCullough or, or Trayvon Flowers? Because it does to me. I mean, you know, it just feels like, you know, if those guys don't pick it up, that, that, you know, the young freshman has a chance to come in and swoop and take some stuff, take some yeah. reps. I was gonna say, it's, it's not all on Flowers McCall, but Tennessee was really bad over the middle and past defense on Saturday, like we've seen in the past. And I know, you know, people have different takes on this pro football focused stuff, the, the grades there, but those two guys were, you know, getting, getting that ready for later this afternoon. Those two guys graded out two of the lowest grades on, on either side of the football. I'm really Flowers surprised. I, I'm really surprised that Flowers, with all the talk about him, I mean, everybody you talked to in the preseason, he he had such a really good preseason. I, I thought he would be more effective than than what we've seen to this point. So, 
I think this is a big weekend to try to get his confidence going. I think the other thing too back there is is where are they with some depth? I mean, they tried to play uh, Kenneth George for a series, got him off the field pretty quickly. Then Nico Slaughter took a series, part of a series for Theo Jackson. They got him off the field pretty quickly as well. But where are Haddon, where are Turnage? What do they do with some depth at those at, at, in the secondary in, in case they, they you know have an injury or something? I, I think this is a big weekend for some of those guys to get an opportunity to try to show themselves, Austin, because I'm with you on Christian Charles. Uh, I think he's moving in the right direction. I like Rucker's speed. I don't know where he's at with the scheme, but Turnage and Haddon are two guys who have not seen a snap on defense and um, be really interested to see how much they play them this week. Well, I, I think they've got to play. Yeah, even if you know if you if you deem them to not quite be ready yet, I, I think you've got to get them out there and just let them, you know, get their feet wet again. At any point, look at Tyon Evans. You could be without a player or two uh, on this football team, and so why not? You know, get these guys some reps because hey, at some point you may have to play them because you're forced to. So. Like it just to me, it behooves all those guys to see a lot of reps, really the whole second half, in my opinion. Like if I'm Tennessee, like somebody like Cade Mays plays about three series, and that's about it. Yeah, as long as you don't turn it over and you do what you're supposed yeah. to do. I mean, this ought to be a game where it's about Tennessee and, and you play a whole bunch of people because, uh, Rob, this is the last chance to kind of find out who you have, what you have before you get into the gauntlet. So you, you better kind of – to borrow that old phrase, above the line and below the line, you better find out who those guys are this week because you're not, not going to have another opportunity to do that for a while. No, not, not, without, not when live bullets aren't flying unless you're just throwing some kid in there because of an injury. Um, I, a couple of spots. I mean, the, the two corners you're talking about, Turnage and Hayden, I mean, I, I would give them maybe the whole second half. But also, what about running back? I mean, you got to find a fourth running back if, in case you get into a situation like you did this past week. We didn't. Somebody, I think somebody else needs to touch the ball. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, obviously they played Jalen Hyatt the whole, or you know, Jalen Wright the whole way um, in, in the second half, and and they weren't comfortable with anybody else. So who you know who do they gain some comfort with this week? Do they gain enough comfort level with somebody this week to play them moving forward? Um, I think the same at linebacker. Do you you know do, does a does a Mohan get some some run at linebacker? What what else do you do there? I know you're rotating. Uh, but do you look at some of those other guys and give them some opportunities? So uh, there, there's plenty to sort through on this team this week. Um, by the way, I thought I thought Jawan Mitchell um, was much better this week. I, I thought clearly he was more comfortable in this defense and, and was more of effective, more a more effective player, which I think is positive for Tennessee moving forward. I thought he was okay in week one. I thought he was much better in, in week two, and so we'll see kind of what all of that looks like for for Tennessee um, as the week progresses. I was. I think one of the underrated things that's happened these first two weeks is, is you feel pretty good about Chase McGrath. I mean, anytime you have a change at kicker, don't bring experience back there. You know, you don't know, but I think again, not not talked about much. But you got if you're Josh Heupel, you got to feel pretty good that, that that's looks like a solid spot for you. And the best thing about Mohan, Chase McGrath, even guys like Jacob Warren and Princeton Fant, they have more years of eligibility. McGrath is not only this year but next year too. And so just to bring some stability to certain positions to me is, is big. So I agree with Rob. I think that that's something that probably hasn't been talked about that should be. Yeah. I, I mean, Josh Heupel didn't inherit a lot, but he inherited a pretty good kicking situation when you talk about Paxton Brooks and you talk about Chase McGrath, no doubt about that. As we get out the door, uh, I was impressed with Jacob Warren. I like what they did with the tight ends with Hendon Hooker. We'll see if that package continues but that, that was pretty effective in what they were doing with both Princeton Fant and Jacob Warren. I think if you're Alex Golas, you take a lot from that in terms of what kind of a weapon those guys can be for you in the passing game moving forward. They weren't much of a factor in week one. Uh, but, you know, I, I, Jacob Warren made a really good catch at the goal line. Um, you know, and, and I, I thought both those guys, put, you know, played well, which is to me is a big encouraging sign moving forward because – the way they split everybody out, the middle of the field is going to have opportunities there if the quarterback can deliver, particularly with the tight end. Yeah, I've always liked Warren as an athlete. I mean, I understand he was limited, in, you know, as far as be, being physical enough to, to have a regular role. But, I mean, you know, you guys saw him in high school. I'm not – I mean, I'm not surprised that, that, he, that when somebody found a way to, to use him. I mean, I think the kid's always had a, a really nice skill set. Yeah, you know, the best thing that happened to him was Josh Heupel. 
the offense that they run. Um, you know, this fits him to a T. Uh, Princeton Fant, uh, a great story to me, just because I mean, I mean, hell, man, he he's played running back, he's played linebacker, he's played just a little bit of everything, and um, you know, to finally find a home at tight end and 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 be able to make plays, both had career high in catches, they combined for nine catches. Um, you know, I think Minnesota Vol asked on the board when was the last time that happened. I'm still trying to figure that out. I've got to look it back at Michael Rivera and see what his most in the game were or was. Um, and then Jason Witten. Like th- to me, those are the two times that stick I, out. I bet you there was a time where, where Chris Brown had nine catches for like 34 yards. And you hover in that in that 2007 dink and dunk offense that cut. Well, potentially. I mean, I mean here's the here's the interesting thing. I mean, he Chris Brown owns the school record for single season receptions by a tight end at 41 in a 13 game season. So he had uh, 147 yards receiving. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many he had in one particular game because he had 41 over 13 games. I'm not, I don't know if he had a big explosion night or not, but I, I mean, it's been a while since they've used the tight ends that way. I mean, I, I think, I, I think with Callaway, um, with the tight ends, I think Tennessee did find some weapons and, and find some guys who can be some weapons for him moving forward. Um, who will get more opportunities this week as this week is a lot about opportunities for a lot of players, for the volunteers. We'll continue to cover it for you. We got the PFF stuff coming up later today. Uh, we'll have comments from Tennessee assistant coaches, Willie Martinez, Cody Burns coming up later today as well. Of course, we got the round table coming up later this week. Uh, we've got our stock report, all of us, all of our weekly content to get you ready uh, for Tennessee's week three opponent, as the volunteers play host to Tennessee Tech. And a game is a lot about Tennessee getting Tennessee better. That's going to do it for this edition of the Tuesday podcast presented to you by Smoky Mountain Organics for Rob Lewis and Austin Price and Brent Hubbs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest podcast every week here on VolQuest.